Well, welcome back to Fort Benning in the Army's Armour and Cavalry Collection. You find me lying uncomfortably, just to fit into the shot, of the loader side of the M67A1. This is part two. If you missed it, go back to part one and catch up. Uh, suffice to say, under here is not a loader's position. It is the main fuel tank. And so I shall now open it up. It is spring-loaded. However, it is also extremely old and not maintained. So it's kind of stiff. Oh, well. So what the Army have done handily enough is they've put an instruction plate on the inside of the loader's hatch so you can see the fueling instructions and also a brief guide as to what all these various valves and switches do. Uh, suffice to say, the first thing you see is a really, really big fuel tank. I mean, it takes up a huge amount of the turret. I'd say maybe even two-thirds in the internal volume, if not more. A couple of handles, uh, filler ports it looks like for main fuel for the air pressure and secondary fuel. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to freeze frame this and this at the same time so you can have a quick uh, comparison if you're that interested just press pause and have a read uh, but otherwise I'm going to move over to the TC side which uh, as you can see is a little bit on the they haven't worked on it yet it's on the it's on the works to clean up some of these tanks but they haven't done it yet and well hopefully I've had my tetanus shot okay so I've come into the TC's cupola clamshell door at the back it would ordinarily be fairly easy to get in and as I'm down at full defilade well actually I mean you can't complain about having all the vision blocks around you now a couple of points to note firstly I am standing on the floor because the seat has been removed there is a seat but I'm not about to put the, the vehicle back together for the sake of a video uh, as I look around I can see the radio rack is on the back wall Intercom system on the right, that's your standard 1960s type intercom system with uh, preset radio frequencies on the top and then the selector for your intercom or radio, what have you, on the bottom. Uh, this one a bit further forward for the gunner. Commander's control handle is on the right elevation and that's how that works. So this bottom lever comes in and out as the physical connection. As you crank left to right, this lever cranks in and out and up and down does exactly the same up here. There's a trigger at the front, the PAM switch on the right for activation. Uh, other than that, he is on top of fuel tanks. He is next to a massive fuel tank and I can only imagine you might be a little bit nervous about an RPG penetration in this thing. Couple of dials, let's see, high pressure air, fuel pressure setting. A huge man, uh, it was this high pressure air. Turn to open, okay. Machine gun, well, it is, of course, the caliber 50 cupola. We'll be up here with a very small ammunition rack on the left. Additional stowage is behind me. It's not like some of the other cupolas where there is a feed that comes all the way around the side, not on this tank. I don't have much else to say about this position, I'm afraid. So I'm going to go forward and uh, see if I can get into the gunner's position. I need to be very careful when I'm sitting on here in the gunner's seat. Again, there's no seat in the gunner's seat, which is unfortunate. It would have a backrest. Uh, I would note some of these wires here that go up where the periscopic sight ordinarily will go. So the periscopic sight was a by 1.5. It was radical for the machine gun and, well, frankly, with a range of 200 yards or whatever on the, on the flame gun, yet didn't really need much more. Uh, but I think what has happened from what, uh, what they're telling me here is that there was an attempt many, many years ago to try to get this thing back into some sort of running order for, um, for demonstration days back in Fort Knox. And I think that is a radio system that they tried installing through where the old primary site was. I don't know why. Internal dome light, uh, a flamethrower, mechanized main armament, M7A1, comma six. Consisting of, it even tells you, fuel and pressure unit M71A, gun, flamethrower M6, for installation on M48A2 type tank chassis. So the Marines had the regular M7, and the Army made whatever modifications the Army wanted to make the M7A1. 
and that gives you the M7A1-6, which is the whole system, and it was on tank flamethrower turret M1, which uh, was the official designation. The coax located to the left is the much-loved, also M73, about 3,500 rounds would be carried. Behind me is the main tank, so uh, as I say, that's about 390 gallons, just shy, of which about 365 was actually usable. It was an additional 12 and a half gallon tank. So the way this worked was you had the 12 and a half gallon tank was effectively your pilot light, your pilot system. That would be pumped through an atomizer. The atomizer is about halfway down the halfway down the tube. I'll put an inset in. A 24,000 volt system for spark plugs would ignite the atomized fuel. At the same time, the main jet would go out. And the atomized fuel, which is now ignited, would then set off the main fuel. And that was what would send your nastiness downrange. When you're done, you, uh, you obviously let go of the trigger. There's a CO2 snuffing system. It basically sets out CO2. So if there is any residual burning fuel inside the gun tube, it will be put out by the CO2. Reportedly, the noise in here when this thing went off was absolutely insane. And uh, you, know, you had to wear the intercom system much louder than a regular tank would be that you would expect. So that is what is taking up all this room in the turret. So as I go around, uh, oh, by the way, uh, total firing time was about 60 seconds, give or take, uh, for, for a load. So as I'm going around, I see uh, fuel air pressure, 10-second uh, fuel pressure. You've got your selector switch between main gun, sorry, machine gun, main gun, and turret power. Coming forward, you got your traditional Cadillacs, no surprises there, and manual traverse. Manual elevation is under here on the left. Fuel pressure regularly, you, you, would, you would think there would be an azimuth indicator or something here. Ordinarily, there probably was, uh, but I, again, you're not exactly shooting indirect in this thing, so there's no point. So uh, you have your regulator here and then forward you're going to see where the 90 millimeter ammo would ordinarily go you're going to see stowage for 762 and well, that's basically it the only thing left is the driver's position hopefully i'm going to be able to get in through the front because there's no way i'm getting in through this side actually as i'm looking around If the gun is at 11 o'clock, it does seem feasible that you can access the driver's compartment through the turret. Uh, that seems to be the only option. There's no option from going around to the side because obviously the massive fuel system is in the way. On second thoughts, let's not go to the M48's driver's hole because I can't get the hatch open. Uh, there's a little locking lever in there that I can't reach and if you are supposed to be able to reach it from out here and nobody in the building right now speaks M48. So in the interest of moving on and getting more vehicles filmed, uh, we're just going to leave it here. I will cover an M48 in the future, and I strongly suspect that the driver's position is going to be pretty similar for all of them. Certainly looking in, it looks a lot like the M103 with the driver's steering wheel. Uh, steering is reversed, in reverse, things like that. So we'll move on. They did not stay very long well in the US Army service. Found the draw interesting and informative again. A shout out and thank you to those who have funded the trip on Patreon and also to the US Army's Commonwealth Cavalry Collection for letting me follow the tank. Take care.